Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mint South. I'm Chris Cooper. Mint will quickly take over your garden. Today we're going to learn how to contain it. Also, we will talk about avoiding some common landscape mistakes. That's just ahead on the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. John Peterson. Mr. John is a Memphis area master gardener and Joellen Diamond will be joining me later. All right, Mr. John. Welcome back to our Family Plot garden. Hey, good to be here. Right. Beautiful herb garden it is. Yes. Right. So now we're gonna talk about containing mint. All right. All right. Are you ready to tackle that? Uh, can we get it contained? Uh, well, good luck, but okay, yeah, good there luck. are some All things right. we can do that well, make it less than it might be. Okay. Um, and uh, so, you know, this started life as a uh, <laughs> as a, a pot that a shrub came in, but I have altered it, <laughs> okay. so it doesn't have a bottom. Because if we if we sunk this in the ground and put the plant in it, there would be a real drainage problem. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, what the way I describe this is, you sink this in the ground. Realistically, you dig a hole, you put this in the ground, right. and you fill the, the dirt back in. Um, and this keeps the, the mint stolons from going all over the garden. Um, no, stolons are underground stems, mm. and uh, you know, they, they, just run. they will take yeah. off, and, uh, and then they'll root. Mm -hmm. And so you can wind up with just a, a, a mess of, of mint. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, they do. There's you know, basically two kinds of mint. There's peppermint and spearmint. Sure. Um, and then there are other hybrids, lemon mint and pineapple mint and so on. But I think you know, they mostly come from one or the other. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I, I have read somewhere that there wasn't that distinction until around 1700. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> 1700. You know, oh, okay. just, it was slightly before my childhood. <laughs> uh, but uh, right. anyway. So, uh, shall we dig a hole? Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Are you volunteering? I am volunteering. Oh, all right. Yeah, sure. Then. I got the gloves here, Mr. John. We can do that. All right. It's going to move it to the side, right? Mm hmm. Okay. Uh oh. Oregano is another plant that can be invasive. Oh, and, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I. Have done the same thing. Now let's see. You know, I think maybe we need to go a little deeper. A little deeper. Yeah, yeah be careful there. Some of it right there. Ready? Ah, look at that. How about that? Look at there. Okay. We happy with that? Yeah. We'll have a little bit of a lip above the soil. Okay. That's fine. That's fine? Sure. All right. Well, some of this we can just get on the outside and maybe use the shovel to get that inside the, the so pot again. The stolons will not go down and come up from under that barrier. They may go over the top, and if they do, they may root, uh, but you've eliminated a lot of possibilities where they can do that. There. Uh -huh. Let's 
just push up some more there. All right, Mr. John, so what happens if a stolen escapes? What do we do then? Uh, you pull it up by the root. Okay. Uh, wash it off and eat it. <laughs> wash it off and eat it? Right. Hmm. I mean, it's a mint, it's right? Mint. <laughs> Any other special attention, watering, or anything we need to be concerned no. about? Um, mints uh, tend to like a little more water than some oh. herbs. Um, Sometimes they're happy with some afternoon shade. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they, they don't care. Okay. Um, and, you know, as many times as you cut it, it will come back. Well, okay. um, I know um, I know people who cut it off at the ground. That always makes me nervous, but it always comes <laughs> back, but it still makes me nervous. It just looks so violent. <laughs> <laughs> it looks violent. All right. Well, it's going to be in full sun here, so yes. hopefully it doesn't care. It'll right. be happy. It'll be happy. Thank you, Mr. John. We appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Sometimes people ask about fertilizing herbs, and I have heard it said that if the herbs grow in too fertile a soil, they don't have as good flavor. I've also heard from very good sources that that doesn't make any difference. But herbs are very forgiving. They frequently just, they're happy. You don't need to fertilize them. Certainly don't fertilize them heavily. Adding compost uh, is always a good idea. Keep the soil light, even if it's not heavily fertilized. All right, Joellen, let's talk about avoiding those common landscape mistakes. And I'm sh pretty sure I have a lot of mistakes in my landscape. <laughs> oh, and, and, and I'm sure that I have done them over the years, too, which is uh -huh. how, you know, you're supposed to learn from your mistakes. That's right. And you're going to teach us. And, and I'm, we're going to talk about some right. of them. Okay. Uh, planting trees, shrubs, annuals, perennials, too deep. I've been there. Okay. Um, that mm -hmm. This is a very common mistake that a lot of people make. What they don't understand is the contain in a container, the soil level in the container should be the same mm -hmm. soil level that is there when they plant it. So you really don't put dirt up over the top of the soil that is, is existing in the container. So you, you're going to plant up to it because then when you mulch, you'll be mulching over the top of it. So it will get covered. Okay. Uh, but, but you really don't want to bury the top of the root balls or any of the containers that you're planting. Now, um, Bald and burlap trees are probably yeah. the worst because you really, sometimes you cannot tell where the actual soil level is on those because by the process of them making the root ball, they will pull up the soil sometimes over the top. Right. And of course it's covered and you can't always see it. So just be aware of that. Um, that's why I tend to plant them a little bit high. So when I open it up the root ball, I can see where the soil level is. And most likely it is either equal or slightly above the existing soil level. And that's perfect. Good. Good. So that's that one. Right. Then of so. course, correct watering. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> right. We get all the, a lot of questions we get here are because of somebody over watering mm -hmm. or under watering, you know, a particular plant. So you need to research your plants and find out what kind of environment that they like. And, and it's gonna be different for every season of the year. There's sunlight's different, the temperature is different, and when you plant a plant, it's different. So it depends on how long ago you planted that plant. If you haven't planted it very long, it doesn't have roots in the existing soil, so it may need to be watered a little bit more than something that is already established. Right. So you just gotta kinda mm -hmm. have to pay attention, and the best way I can tell is to research what kind of plants you're planting, put them in the right place, and then monitor with your what moisture meter, which is your hand. Which is this? <laughs> yes. I mean, you stick your finger in the ground. Right. Don't just look at it and say, oh, it looks like it needs water. Put your hand in the ground. Is the soil moist? Okay. Does it really need to be watered? So that, that's how you do correct watering. And I'll tell you something else with that, too. I usually tell people to group plants by water requirements. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So you don't want to put a drought tolerant plant, you know, in the same position where you have, you know, a plant that needs a lot of water. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah. I agree. That's... And that's part of the research. Right, it's part of the research, right. And then the second one is the right plant in the right place, uh, which is exactly what you were just saying. Yeah. If, you, if you've got the right plants, you know they're, you research them, you know the kind of water requirements that they need, mm. the environment that mm -hmm. they need, the sun, the shade, whatever it is, then you can plant them in the correct place. The other thing is, 
this is mature size of the tree. Uh -huh. the, the tree, the shrub, whatever you're planting, think, find out what the mature size of it is so oh. that you don't crowd it. Because then if it's crowded, you're not gonna get airflow, you're gonna get diseases and then maybe bugs popping yes. up with them. So that all is a factor in the, where it's planted in the right place. Makes sense. Uh, power lines. I, yeah, I, just, I, I have just good watched one. somebody in a new planting plant a, a little uh, whole row of trees. And if you look up, they're right under <laughs> power lines. I mean, seriously, what a mistake. could you not have yeah. planted them 10 or 20 feet you know, further back and gotten the same effect, oh but, but then they wouldn't be in the power lines. So yeah, because we know what's going to happen when it yeah, starts to grow up into the power lines. So just, right. just watch right. the power lines and the mature yeah. size of your trees. That's okay. the important part Good about one. that. Um, oh, pruning mistakes. Yeah. Now, I love to prune. One of my favorite horticulture practices is pruning. Yeah, I prune like I that. love pruning. Oh, right. But uh, some people plant prune at the wrong time of the year, and sure. they, the biggest problem is the shrubs and trees that bloom. Right, I would agree. And the biggest way I can say the, the best rule is after it finishes blooming, prune it. Prune it, okay. That way you're more apt to not get into the, the time of year that it's trying to set blooms for the next year. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people will cut off the blooms for next year, but prune it as soon as it finishes blooming, you won't have that problem. We get that question a lot at the extension office. Mm -hmm. When should I prune this? All right. Yeah. yeah. That's a yeah. good point. Okay. Yeah, like research your plants. Research. How about girdling? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Trees and branches. <laughs> There's so many things that can girdle a tree. Um, you know, if you put it too close to a fence, you'll note if you've ever seen trees and plants growing into fences. I have, I have. Um, you, even the plastic tags that uh -huh. identify the plants, that it, the, the tree that, can't right. make them go away. That's right. <laughs> right. They I'll kind of that. include them in there, and but that restricts the water and air movement around right. that, so you don't want that. Okay. Um, and you're, it's just, it's just not going to work very well. Okay. The other thing that girdles a tree is weed eating around it or yes. actually mowing mm -hmm. and hitting the trunk mm -hmm. of a tree. That can, you know, every time you hit, you you have a callus on your finger from writing, you know, you get a callus on certain parts of your finger. That's what happens when you're weed eating around the trunk of a tree. Mm. You don't see it, but there's a callus there and it's affecting the water flow mm -hmm. and uptake of the tree. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if essentially it, uh, it girdles the tree. All right. Wow. A weed eater blight. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. How about staking trees staking too tightly? Trees, which I've seen all around the landscape it, here. You know, it, yeah. it's nice to have staked trees because, you know, I understand you don't want it to move and you don't want it to fall over because you've taken a lot of time, especially on large sure. trees. And I, I think, I agree, they should be staked if it's a large tree and they don't want it to, to blow over. Okay. Uh, but they shouldn't be taut. They should be loose. Okay. So it, it, that you want to see the tree in the wind be able to move right. just a little bit because that's going to create, uh, the tree is going to produce what they call reaction wood. Okay, for that. And that will help the tree learn to stand up on its own. Cool. Because if you don't, if you uh, tie it tightly and don't let it move, you restrict the it ne you're, it's never going to learn okay. to have reaction wood to be able to stand up. Okay, that's good. Okay. Uh, scalping grass. Scalping the grass. Uh -oh. Yes, I mean everybody has that one place <laughs> that you know they keep going. Oh, oh, well, it, oh, it looks a little brown. Well, I, I scalp that little yeah. section. That's okay. Well, just fix it. Either raise it or lower it. Whatever you need to do, and then you won't have that scalped place anymore. Okay. And it's usually the level of the the soil. Right. That's that's affecting that. And it will brown out. So yeah, it doesn't look good. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's that's another one common mistake. Uh, knowing the difference between an annual and perennial, mm -hmm. how many times do we get a question, is this an annual or is this a yeah. perennial? And you know, the majority of plants are end up being perennials because trees, shrubs, you know, all are perennials. They stay around all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between an annual and a perennial. An annual completes its entire life cycle in one growing season okay. and then it doesn't live anymore. Right except if in, tro in the tropics. Oh, huh, yeah. <laughs> you know, when it yeah. gets to be warm outside, it doesn't freeze, and then it's gonna continue to live. But everywhere else, it will complete its season in, of living in one year, okay. and then it will die. Perennials stay around year after year. I like perennials, okay. 
bulb was planting the right side. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, if you do do make a mistake yeah. and plant one upside down, it will it grow. Will? Okay, I was but, wondering that. But you, but it will take longer and take more energy to turn itself around because the okay. it will try to right itself. Okay. Uh, but it just watch, and usually uh, you can the, tell, right? The the the, the, the point, and and sometimes this is what people get confused with. All right. Sometimes bulbs are starting to, the stalk is starting to come out. Not the roots, but the stalk. Okay. And they think that's a root. Okay, I got you. I and so, I, you know, just try to look on the bottoms or around on the bulbs. And if you see a wider area that looks like mm -hmm. there's small little holes in a circle around it, that usually is a key that, that it's going to be roots. Okay. So you put that side down and the, and the other side up. But the usually there's side. a point that, you know, there'll be... Uh, some sheathing around the bulbs and they'll come up to a little bit of a point okay. and that's the top to, to face up. Okay. Uh, the worst thing, <laughs> now, everybody, I like this one. everybody yeah. is guilty yeah. of this, myself yeah. included. Yeah. Include me in that as well. Impulse mm -hmm. buying. Not having the plan, not knowing what the plan is, just going out and saying, oh, I really like this plant, yeah. and then they're going to come get it and, and plant it. In the, and the, this is the problem. You know, you you may not know a place to put it right away. So what uh, do you do? You let it sit out. Just sit, yeah, garage or and, outside. Yeah, yeah, and then you, you forget to water it or you yes. water it too much. And if, the, if you're going to do a lot of impulse buying, I suggest to have an area that you would like, plant it in the ground. And so it'll be in the ground while you're trying to figure out where to put it. All right. All right. I like that though. <laughs> I see if I can do that, but yeah, impulse buying. Yeah, yeah impulse I think we're buying. all guilty. If, if you're Everybody's a plant person, guilty. you're guilty Definitely of that. Definitely guilty of that, yes. All right. Appreciate that, Ms. Joella. Good stuff. Avoiding those landscape mistakes. Let's see if we can get better with that next time. Yeah, yeah. myself included. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>
she doesn't want to use the systemic insecticides. I mean, could you understand that? Mm -hmm. yeah, I could definitely understand Absolutely. that. Um, but she wants to use the alcohol-soaked Q-tips. She can actually do that. And it actually works pretty well when mm -hmm. you have light infestations. Okay. okay. Uh, if you have a lot of those mealybugs there, then yeah, you have to consider using the soaps, insecticidal soap, and the oils. Yeah, neem oil. Right, neem oil, B1. Uh, read and follow the label uh, on that, Miss Lisa. So that's what I would do. And this is probably, I'm wondering if this is an indoor plant. So you have any thoughts about you know, using When I read the dinner? question, I wondered if it was an indoor plant. Yeah, I wonder if it, yeah indoor. Um, yeah, because I, I don't think I would use a systemic insecticide, you know, period, you know, no. whether it was indoor or outdoor. You know, you can see them, uh, very pronounced, these miller bugs. Uh, yeah, and if you have a light infestation, again, you can use the Q-tips that are soaked in alcohol. Be careful uh, not to dab the leaves, you know, with the alcohol because you don't want to damage the leaves. Mm -hmm. But that's what I would do. I would use that in, instead of the systemic insecticides. So there you go, Miss Lisa, good for you. All right, be careful, read and follow the label, all right? Here's our next viewer email. I have yellow and black caterpillars eating my parsley. What are they and how do I control them? And this is Steve from Memphis, Tennessee. So Mr. John, what are those yellow and black caterpillars? Uh, <laughs> those are the larvae of the swallowtail butterfly, almost certainly. Almost certainly. Yeah. And uh, they, they can defoliate your plant in a couple of days. But the plant will come back and because uh, they'll move on to another one and they, they will attack uh, just about any member of that family, uh, parsley, cilantro, fennel. And uh, I know people that deliberately plant plants of that family just to attract the swallowtail. Mm. Uh, and then you know, they, they go through, they chew everything in sight, they move on to the next plant. And you, know, you need to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> that word's coming up again right. today, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. the plant should recover. The plant should recover. And then you've, you've fed those beautiful butterflies. That's right. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. Yeah, so those plants are in the carrot family, mm -hmm. All right? Beautiful butterfly. Yes. Like swallowtail butterfly. Yeah. It's the state butterfly. Is it? Yeah. I didn't know I that. Yeah, so it's a beautiful butterfly. Uh, plant more, you know, if you're mm -hmm. concerned. And as far as controlling them, you don't really have to. No. Uh, just again, just plant more if you want to just pick them off, you know, put them somewhere else. You can right. do that. But outside of that, yeah. I think you'd be fine. But don't kill them. Just don't put them someplace. Put them somewhere else. Yeah. Right. That's what I would do. Just put them somewhere else. So thank you for that question, Mr. Steve. All right. Appreciate that. Here's our next viewer email. Can you grow herbs and vegetables together? And this is Kathy. I think that's an interesting question. So what do you think about that? Can you grow them together? Absolutely. Absolutely, he says. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the herbs that are perennials that are, are going to spread, you know, they may not be convenient in a, a vegetable garden where you've got things in rows, but you can put them in their own row on the side. You can put them in pots. Uh, the, the ones that are really invasive, like the mints and the oreganos, uh, I would certainly put in pots or, um, or, or put in a that's something that you uh, will, will keep those stolons from, from uh, branching out. But absolutely, I know people who really believe that, um, that herbs can be companion plants and, ah, and that's the term. Uh, yeah. prevent uh, or discourage diseases or discourage uh, insect pests. And uh, yeah. I don't know that everybody agrees about that, yeah. but on the other hand, they look good. They look you know? good, right? <laughs> They're and good. you're growing them. So. Right. It may make for better flavor and things like that. So you have any examples for us of herbs that grow well with certain vegetables? Uh, the one I remember, because it works in the kitchen too, is <laughs> grow basil with your tomatoes. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and, uh, so th that's the one I remember. Yeah, basil, uh, tomatoes. I've heard basil, peppers, mm -hmm. right? And I've also heard lettuce and mint, believe mm. it or not, yeah, to confuse snails. Well, yeah, this is what some of the old Thomas would tell me. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There you go. But you can't grow them together. Uh, so, absolutely. So, Miss Kathy, you can't grow those together. If anything, like Mr. John said, it looks good, right? <laughs> right. It looks good. And it may help out with flavor, too, as well. All right. So, thank you for that question, Miss Kathy. We appreciate that. All right. Here's our next viewer email. Why are my spinach 
lettuce, and other cool season crops flowering. Can I still eat them? And this is Angela. That's an interesting question. So it's gotten a little warm, you know, here mm -hmm. in uh, Memphis, right? I bet you I know what's happening, right? So when it starts to warm up, it's a signal to the plant to start to go to seed. Go to seed. Yeah. Right. So it goes to flower, it goes to seed. Have you had that experience before? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Okay. And can you still eat them? Well, yeah, do they taste okay? <laughs> I mean, that's the question. That's I know, the question, right. Uh, because when lettuce goes to seed, uh, it can s start to taste really bitter. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, pick a leaf and eat it. And if it tastes bitter, then don't do it. And if it tastes yeah. fine, then use it. There's, not a, not a problem with you know it's no, not anything toxic in the plant. Right, it's, right. It's just that's just bitter. going through the series. Right. It's cycle. just bitter. Yeah. So again, it's just warming up. Again, these are cool season crops, and mm -hmm. as it starts to warm up, yeah. I mean, they're thinking, okay, yeah, it's time to produce a flower. And mm -hmm. It's time to you know get those seeds going, yeah. you know, and that's it, right? So of course it's gonna be bitter. Yeah. Some of those plants you can plant in fall too, and you, you get, can. get a you little. Can get a little bit of a crop if the winter isn't too bad, it, right. you may last through the whole time. All right. So, yeah, get out what you can now, come mm -hmm. back in the fall. Right. Right, plant in the fall, and you don't have to worry about that bitter taste. Right. Then. So thank you, Angela, we appreciate that question. All right, Mr. John, that was fun, thank you much. Thank All you. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org and the mailing address is Family Plot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about anything we talked about today, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. We have links to extension publications about everything we talked about that you can print and take into your garden. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.